And yeah. uh, I am absolutely happy to present Eugen Demler, who is a professor at the Harvard University. He is one of the leaders and made many seminal contributions to the strongly correlated matter, to polaron physics, to topological flaquette physics, as in cold atoms, as in condensed matter systems. Eugen has made his PhD. Uh, at Stanford University in 1998. Oh, okay. yes. And after the short postdoctoral appointment okay. at the Institute of the Theoretical Physics, he became right. faculty at Harvard right. in 2001. Uh, Eugene has a number of fellowships and prizes. I will just mention a few, including the Simons and Sloan Fellowships, Simons Research Award. So, uh, let me just very briefly remind it that as usual, we don't interrupt the speakers, but uh, questions always welcome in a chat window. So uh, Eugene, please feel free to go ahead. Thank you, Dima. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Uh, thank you for accommodating my uh, schedule. So I apologize if this time sort of forced people to change their plans. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, what we have been doing in the last uh, couple of years, uh, sort of in the context of quantum simulators in general and uh, uh, primary collaborators in uh, theoretical work, uh, uh, young people, so Fabian Grust uh, has been uh, this work part of this work started when he was still a postdoc at Harvard, but has been in Munich uh, for a while. Annabel Bort, who uh, has recently started as a postdoc at Harvard ITAMP. Dries Sells uh, was also a postdoc, but since then moved uh, to start his own group at NYU and Flatiron, and Kushal Sitharam, uh, who is currently a graduate student. And what made uh, this work particularly Exciting is uh, collaboration with our experimental colleagues, particular groups of Emanuel Bloch, Markus Greiner, Wolgan Ketterle, Chris Monroe, uh, and Marco Cetina. And I'll mention uh, uh, these uh, collaborations as we go along. Okay, so what's happening? Uh, that's the reason I cannot. Oh, okay. Yes, sorry, uh, some technical glitch. Uh, all right, so this is an outline of my talk. Uh, I'll start uh, by talking about the Fermi Hubbard model. In the beginning, I'll discuss something that's not controversial, uh, but uh, at least on the theoretically, but uh, uh, that has been demonstrated experimentally using quantum gas microscope. So this will set the stage for the type of measurements that have become possible in the last uh, few years. Then I will talk about uh, sort of more uh, kind of interesting uh, to say uh, subjects which are still causing debates and this is the subject of uh, polarons uh, in the Fermi Hubbard model in two dimensions uh, and uh, we'll, we'll even touch about like what quantum gas microscopes now tell us about the phase diagram. Uh, I'll say a few words about uh, like some of the unusual tools uh, that went people are now using uh, to uh, analyze uh, the synthetic matter, namely uh, convolutional neural networks. And then in the second half of my talk, I'll talk about the idea to use quantum simulators to do something more practical for humankind. And this is an MR inference for metabolomics. If you don't know what metabolomics is, don't worry. I didn't know it myself until a few months ago when we started collaborating uh, with our colleagues from medical school, uh, and I'll show you, I'll try to argue that this is a very exciting field for quantum simulations uh, and quantum uh, computing. Okay, so I'll not spend much time uh, on the motivation, on the uh, idea of uh, why we're interested in the Fermi Hubbard model uh, in its connection to HITC. I assume that most people have uh, heard about this idea uh, on a few, uh, kind of quite a few talks. Uh, the uh, kind of key argument that I uh, want to bring up is uh, that uh, okay, we have uh, an artificially created periodic potential for fermions. In this case, fermions are shown as the red and the blue balls. 
uh, and in principle parameters uh, of this lattice, including say the ratio of tunneling to interaction can be controlled uh, and also the number of fermions. So this allows to go through the phase diagram and uh, uh, this, uh, as you know, remains one of the uh, most important questions in condensed metaphysics. So when uh, I discuss theoretical uh, simulations, I'll often use not the full Hubbard model, but it's a derivative, the so-called TG model. So we know uh, that uh, if uh, the double occupied sites are very costly in the limit when the uh, repulsion U is large, Right. Uh, and uh, so one can integrate out uh, the states virtually, and then we're left with anti ferromagnetic exchange interaction, which is seen here, that spins prefer to be aligned in the opposite direction. Uh, and then when we look at the hopping uh, term, then this hopping term only acts in the subspace uh, where there are no double occupancies. So uh, we can change occupancies between zero and one, but we uh, exclude all the double occupied sites. Just to give you an idea of where experiments currently are, uh, uh, let us uh, start by something kind of more conventional from the point of view of condensed metaphysics measurements of two point correlation functions. Uh, and uh, so these experiments from uh, the uh, Greiner's group. And you see spin spin correlation function, but it is corrected uh, because we know that the dominant correlations are anti ferromagnetic so as we go from side to side you know we remove this uh, oscillating sign and uh, here on the right you see the highest temperatures you see that the correlations decay very rapidly and uh, then uh, as uh, uh, temperature is lowered correlations become longer and longer ranged and uh, if Okay, we know that in two dimensions at any finite temperature, strictly speaking, there is no longer in order, but we can look at how the correlation length increases with lowering the temperature. And here we are uh, basically in the regime uh, where the correlation length is essentially as long as the system size. So therefore, uh, it kind of it, it will not uh, become much better uh, this uh, from the point of view of uh, anti ferromagnetic order, uh, even with further lowering the temperature. Uh, then there are other interesting measurements, including transport measurements uh, that I will not talk about, uh, like exploring pseudo gap regime, but I'll uh, talk about just another subset of uh, kind of experiments exploring this uh, underdoped regime uh, uh, with an emphasis on more unusual measurements made possible uh, in uh, by cold gases uh, platforms. Uh, so uh, the Key uh, ingredient in my today's presentation is uh, the new technology that uh, appeared recently. And this is the technology of uh, quantum gas microscopes. Essentially, in a nutshell, it's a technique which allows to measure every particle in the system. So it's really kind of theory stream. You get a snapshot of the many body state and you can characterize it beyond uh, what we're used to of just two point correlation functions. You can compute high order correlation function like the distribution functions and so on. And we will see how it changes uh, uh, kind of the type of questions that we can ask. Okay, uh, as I said, uh, let me start with something uh, for which we have uh, from theoretical understanding, and this is one dimensional systems. And let me begin by reminding you a basic idea of spin charge separation. So consider from a Hubbard model in 1D, uh, even at zero temperature at half filling on every side, we have a fermion. We cannot have broken symmetry. So the best cartoon uh, of the ground state is to think of this kind of like short range. Uh, uh, singlets uh, that spins combine into singlets uh, and but they are sort of are more likely to find them at short distances than at long distances. Now imagine removing one of the fermions and then we're left with a hole but we're also left with unpaired spin one half. So and uh, now ask a question well so what happens if we let uh, this configuration evolve? What we will find is that they separate and this is the essence of spin charge separation in one dimensional systems. So now this hole, right, which uh, leaves now in the kind of singlet background uh, is called the holon, and then uh, the spin one half, right, and paired spin, which also leaves in spin singlet background is called a spinner. Uh, but notice uh, something uh, interesting uh, that actually, if we look at spin configuration about uh, around the holon, 
they actually are such as if the colon uh, is not there. So, and what this means uh, is uh, that, let's see, if we look at spins as, uh, which are neighboring to the colon, they're very likely to form a singlet state and therefore they'll have anti-ferromagnetic correlation. And this should be contrasted to completely undoped system where uh, we look at sites which are two sites away and they will be ferromagnetically aligned. In fact, this uh, uh, has been, uh, the argument can be strengthened even further. So uh, it was shown by Agata and Shiba uh, that uh, if we take like large U from a Hubbard model, the TG model, uh, at finite doping, then if we remove uh, all the uh, sites where there is a hole, uh, and so we just sort of basically are compressing the system by removing sites uh, without uh, fermions, uh, and uh, this is what they call the squeeze space, and in the squeeze space, the wave function will be the same as if the system was completely undoped. Of course, uh, like it feels like a Gedanken experiment, right, because in order to think about squeezed space, what you have to do is you have to know what is happening on every site so that you can literally remove sites which are empty. But uh, as we said, well, this is what we get from quantum gas microscopes since we measure every particle in the system. So uh, this is the data uh, from Bloch's group. And like this upper plot gives you some idea of how experiments are done. They use a gradient of magnetic uh, field to separate spin up and spin down particles, and then they image them simultaneously. So when you see uh, a kind of a particle in the bottom row, this means it's spin down. You see a particle in the upper row, this means it's spin up. And when we don't see a particle either in spin down or spin up, this is an empty site. But if we look at, uh, now let's just talk about the measurements. So here you can see a measurements of the traditional correlation function. Right, and so the green line is the uh, undoped case, and okay, nearest neighbors anti-ferromagnetic correlations. Uh, then next nearest neighbors become ferromagnetic, and then it oscillates just like as we would expect. Of course, it decays due to quantum and thermal fluctuations. But now, uh, can uh, look at what happens when we start adding uh, uh, holes. Right, so now the. Uh, uh, now, we, as soon as we have holes, like these two spin correlation functions actually lose this alternating character, right? Okay, nearest neighbor is still anti-ferromagnetic, but then already next nearest neighbor stops being ferromagnetic. It starts looking uh, also like anti-ferromagnetic and it just smoothly decays. And the uh, reason is clear, right? That while we're now mixing, remember we said oh, across the hole, we would have anti-ferromagnetic correlations when we're looking at distance of two lattice constants, but if uh, there is no hole in between, it will be ferromagnetic. So when we average, of course, things wash out. But now uh, we can look at spin uh, correlations in the squeeze space, right? After you just remove uh, uh, all the holes and you see that in squeeze space, spin correlations uh, look uh, the same, essentially the same, no matter what the doping uh, level. Okay, uh, but this is uh, obviously a kind of a system that we understand very well. There are exact solutions. Let's uh, start discussing something which is uh, more controversial, but much more interesting. And this is the 2D for me Hubbard model. So for people who are not experts, let me uh, give you a sort of one of the uh, arguments for why uh, the idea of whole propagation of the interplay of spin charge separation is very subtle in uh, two-dimensional systems. So imagine starting with just a hole in an anti-ferromagnetic state, right? So you surround it with a classical anti-ferromagnetic state, and now a hole propagates, and something interesting happens, right? As a hole propagates, it rearranges spins, and we started in the configuration in which all nearest neighbor bonds had anti-ferromagnetic correlations. But now you can see that some of the bonds acquired ferromagnetic correlations. And uh, as a whole propagates further, the number of these uh, kind of misaligned spins gets larger. So that's what people usually describe as uh, that the motion of a whole generates a string. Right? So it's a string of frustrated spin configurations, which increases magnetic energy. And uh, so this. Uh, Kind of idea that okay, uh, like a mobile hole is actually uh, find its motion uh, frustrated uh, in an anti state has been pointed out early on, 
at this time, I think some of the earliest work uh, was done by Nagayev, and he came up with uh, one of the early proposals saying, oh, what can happen is uh, that around the whole, you will get actually an island of aromagnetism, because if uh, all the spins were aligned, this would actually lower kinetic energy uh, of uh, the uh, whole. Well, it turns out that for the Fermi-Hubbard model, uh, this kind of regime where the uh, uh, where the whole really sort of induces for a magnetic, truly for a magnetic halo uh, uh, around itself is realized only at very large U. So I, well, it's not relevant for, let's say, cuprates or uh, for experiment that I'll be describing about. But this idea that uh, like a moving uh, hole actually strongly modifies magnetic relations uh, has been a very important uh, subject. And uh, I think. Uh, Again, with uh, sort of important uh, papers by Mott, uh, Katznason, actually, uh, Alex Sushkov uh, did their interesting work uh, on this. And if people are interested in a recent review, there is a nice review by uh, Francini at all. And okay, let me also point out uh, uh, one fact that will be, I'll be sort of in showing experimental data, I will be jumping between whole uh, doped systems and Dublin doped systems, in which we add one extra particle. It turns out that for the Fermi Hubbard model, uh, there is a perfect equivalence. You can see it from the segment of frustration, right? It, as a Dublin moves uh, uh, in the antiphromatic state, as you can see here, it also generates this frustrated uh, stream. Okay, so uh, I'll, but let so therefore do not be surprised if like some of the experimental data, I sometimes show results for holes, sometimes show results for doublets. But let's go back to the idea of the string. So the uh, idea that, okay, because fundamentally what we're discussing now is sort of like a one dimensional system where we said, oh, we create, uh, remove a uh, fermion, then there is a spin and a hole and then they separate. But now what we can see is uh, that there is a string left between them. It's a string of frustrated spin configurations. So uh, early on, uh, uh, people uh, like Bob Laughlin noticed analogy between uh, this phenomenon and confinement in QCD. And they argued that we should uh, think about magnetic polarons the same way as we think about mesons in QCD that just like mesons in QCD are quarks, right? And so it's a bound state. And if we try to separate them, then there is a linear potential that's keeping them uh, together. So the argument is that, well, we should, uh, that's how we should understand uh, uh, magnetic polarons as just bound states of spinons, uh, of a spin and a holon. And in fact, one can make uh, this argument uh, uh, kind of, uh, more quantitative and basically consider, let's say kind of zero. So the question would be to say, okay, spin dynamics is slow, J is slow, let me freeze the spin, let me look at, uh, the uh, motion of a hole. So as a hole moves, it actually rearranges spins. Uh, and therefore I can solve, uh, I can basically solve like a tight binding model where I'm looking at the motion of a hole. But uh, when I am solving this tight binding model, I should remember that the trajectory matters. Right? Usually when you solve a tight binding model, uh, I'll just motion of a particle to so just characterize uh, instantaneous state by where the particle is. But here, depending on how the uh, hole arrived at a given point, we will have different physical states. That's why when we solve our tight binding model, we have to do it in a space which includes all, which labels all different uh, string uh, configurations. And this is a, a kind of a beta lattice. And then you can also introduce, uh, uh, in addition to hopping, linear potential, right? How much energy, uh, uh, how much magnetic energy increases as uh, the length of the string uh, increases. And uh, you can, and then once we understand uh, uh, this kind of a hole around the static uh, spin on, then we can use analog of born oppenheimer approximation, say, oh, now when a spin on moves, it actually, it has to carry this dressing, this kind of hole on wave function around it. And uh, this renormalizes the effective uh, uh, exchange uh, for the spin on. Okay, uh, so, uh, and I'll sort of uh, later on, I'll show you results of this uh, model uh, in comparison to experiments and numerics, but let me now continue with experimental results. So these are still uh, Munich uh, experiments from the Munich group. What they're looking at here is uh, how, a whole, how a Dublin, a single Dublin changes magnetic uh, correlations. 
So, okay, here you basically in this figure, you should uh, think about it as magnetic relations relative to the Dublin. So Dublin is placed in the center, but it doesn't mean that the Dublin is uh, localized. Actually, Dublin is free to move anywhere, right, in this two-dimensional system. Uh, but when we represent spin configurations, uh, then we always put Dublin back in the center because we're, all, we're really trying to understand how Dublin, uh, uh, how spin configurations are affected relative to where the Dublin is. So therefore, here you can see color coding of nearest neighbor spin configurations, but as a function of distance to the Dublin. So this is already a three-point correlation function, right? Because there is one position of the Dublin, then there are two uh, sites uh, uh, for which we measure spin correlations. And you can see that far away uh, from the Dublin, okay, we get strong anti relations, basically the same as uh, in the undoped material. And then they are reduced in the magnitude as well we can uh, approach the Dublin. Uh, if we look at diagonal correlations, uh, situation is much more striking. Uh, so far away from the Dublin, we get ferromagnetic correlations just as we expect in a uh, classical anti-ferromagnetic state. But next to the Dublin, we see that correlations actually change sign, right? From uh, ferromagnetic, they become anti-ferromagnetic. And that this is something that uh, one can understand uh, very easily. And uh, imagine just this configuration of a hole, right, starting in an antiphromagnetic state, but now as a hole moves, two fermions, which used to be nearest neighbor and have antiphromagnetic correlations, now they are actually on the diagonal close to the hole, right? And that's why close to the Dublin, we can now get diagonal antiphromagnetic uh, configurations. Uh, so now what we can do, we can compare these results of uh, uh, basically magnetic correlations as a function of distance to the uh, Dublin. And uh, so I'll just look at the green line. So I will not be discussing the case of what happens if the Dublin is spin. So on the left, uh, you can see experiments. On the right, you can see the theory. And so what the theory was doing, as I said, just really uh, basically looking at this kind of string model uh, of uh, a hole like circling uh, around the spinner. And uh, uh, this you can, uh, we can compare, uh, let's say, nearest neighbor correlations uh, uh, as a function of distance uh, to the Dublin, or we can look at uh, diagonal correlations uh, as a function of distance to the Dublin. And you see that uh, indeed, like there is a change of sign that comes out of this model, just like as we saw in experiments. And uh, again, so I, maybe one thing that to stress, uh, this is a model like this geometrical string model is not fully microscopic. It's fairly phenomenological because all uh, to compute the kind of the string tension, how much energy increases, we take spin correlations either from Monte Carlo or from actual experimental data for undoped system. Uh, so we do not try to compute. So therefore, for example, we're not putting this kind of picture of classical antiphromatic state. We're not saying that the change of uh, correlations will be just because you rearrange classical spins. No, we're just saying, oh, we know which correlations we had when there was no hole. And now, like if the hole uh, reshuffles the spins, uh, so we know that configuration has changed and how much the magnetic interaction energy changes. And you can, on experiments uh, at finite temperature, uh, through, uh, if you want to do theoretical analysis, then you're limited to, let's say, DMRG. But in the case of the MRG, we can, again, compute this uh, uh, kind of magnetic correlation as a function of distance uh, to the Dublin at zero temperature and compare it to the geometrical string model, uh, and it works uh, pretty well. So any questions so far? Yeah, uh, I actually have a question. So the correlation functions, they decay at one mostly at one side so one couldn't think about that this cloud this ferromagnetic cloud is have the only i don't know two or three sides together exactly. so they're, right. they're, pretty, they're pretty small yeah so at this point it is a fairly small polaron i would not call it ferromagnetic right it's it's like correlation spin correlations that change so really think about it what's happening is like as a hole moves around it reshuffles the spins Right, it's not really turning them all ferromagnetic, but it's reshuffled okay. them. Okay. So, and that's why you see sort of much more scrambled correlations uh, than in a uh, kind of in a in a, in a pristine state. Uh, 
Uh, and you are right that then this polaron is not particularly large. So this is correct. And uh, it's and it has to do both with uh, it primarily has to do with the size of the wave function of uh, the colon wave function relative to the spin. Uh, can it be described by the quasi particle just with mass or other parameters? So that is a well known uh, effect that actually, if you look at the coherent part of propagation uh, of the whole, so the coherent part uh, has energy scale set by J, not by T, but by J. Mm -hmm. And then there is an incoherent part set by T. So from that point of view, if you want a quasi particle, yeah, quasi particle a part has a very strongly renormalized mass, right? Because it's set by J, uh, one over J rather than one over T. And this has been seen in recent experiments by Marcus Greiner's book. Unfortunately, due to kind of lack of time, I threw this out, but you can, they, they literally measured this. So they release a hole and they see that at short time scales, it expands with a scale of T. You can renormalize, like you can change microscopic parameters and see that they all scale with T, but at long time expansion or like long time obviously means low energy, expansion is controlled by J. So this is when uh, it's more like the spin on propagation. So at short times, like a hole and just starts moving around the spin on, but at longer time, a spin on dressed by a hole uh, keeps moving. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I guess, um, thanks for this interesting talk. With regards to the Born-Oppenheimer approximation here, you, you, you're assuming the spin system is acting on a much slower time scale than the electronic hole. Is that is that what yes. you mean by yes, change? basically? And <clears throat> how um, robust is that assumption in real spin systems? I mean, I know in any ferromagnets, the dynamics, the spin dynamics can be extremely fast, like femtoseconds, picoseconds. Mm -hmm. It seems to me those time scales mm -hmm. aren't that different from electronic transport uh, time scale. Uh, Maybe not in model systems, but in, in real systems, I'm just I, curious. Okay, I agree with you that if it depends, becomes a kind of a tricky question. What do, like when we talk about the time scale of uh, right of the whole motion, do we take just tunneling T or do we take the full bandwidth of 8T? Right. So so the honest answer is okay, I it's not really like a microscopic parameter, which is 10 to minus two or 10 to minus three. Like if you let me take something like of the uh, well, basically I don't know, like bandwidth, I can maybe argue that okay, the uh, the ratio uh, the ratio is made like for parameters that I use maybe like one quarter, so, uh, uh, but it seems like a model based on this assumption uh, agrees quite well with experiments, uh, and that's why unfortunately doing something more accurate is somewhat tricky. But I will also show you where it breaks down. But there seems to be uh, more that has to do with you know going to high doping regime where the polarons start to overlap. So yeah, so I mean, it's it's not, okay, I agree with you, it's not a kind of parameter where like in BCS you have a uh, kind of uh, parametrically small parameter. Uh, may I ask a question, Eugene? Sure. Uh, yeah. So a single yeah. polaron as a function of T over J, you expect a series of uh, phase transition or series of uh, level crossing starting from T over J order of five, if I remember correctly, up to T over J about 80, different spins. Uh, did anybody try to observe this? No, as, uh, as I said, so far experiments, so yeah, this large T over J when it becomes truly ferromagnetic, uh, they it can be observed uh, in principle. So far people focused on T over J, uh, sort of basically U over T of around eight, you know, roughly that's where kind of high TC, like Coop rates, ratios are. I mean, ah, so in not, other not experiments, so... people have gone to larger U. No, but still you expect safe transition from effective SZ0 to SZ1 and then SZ2, like a series of transitions for different T over J. Okay, Alex, so that I think you should formulate, you see the idea is that you wish uh, one should formulate this more as a prediction in terms of, let's say the three point correlation function. Because like fundamentally what you are getting is a snapshot. So uh, I think like our colleagues will be very receptive to predictions which are kind of tuned for what they can measure. 
Because okay, what you are good. describing now is more like, oh, if I really fix my magnetization, what's the lowest energy state? But that's not what you're measuring in experiments. So what you're measuring in experiment is a high order correlation function. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, so I think it's a very good question, but we have to formulate it in a way that is sort of related to experiments. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other questions? But I'll talk about like some of the interesting physics here of this uh, bound state. Okay, uh, right, let me move on then. Okay, so uh, I talked about the strings uh, that uh, hole induces when it moves and through an empty from magnet. And of course the question is, oh, but can we see such strings directly? And uh, this was, uh, because basically so far we talked about like three point correlation function, but to see a string like we really seems to require like analyzing the entire snapshot. Uh, and this is a task undertaken by our colleagues from Marcus Greiner's group. And uh, basically the goal is, as we said, as a whole moves, right? It induces this string of uh, frustrated spin configurations. The question is, oh, can we actually identify it uh, in this snapshot images? So, okay, let me give just one uh, uh, kind of comment that Marcus's system has uh, the lowest possible temperatures, but unfortunately they cannot sort of resolve simultaneously spin up and spin down, un unlike the Munich experiments. So that's why they have to choose. Uh, either they see sort of they can image blue particles, like spin down particles, or the red particles, which are spin up. And if they have two particles uh, on the same side, uh, Dublin, again, for technical reason, it just shows up as an empty site. But as you will see, this is not a showstopper. Okay, so uh, how do the measurements look like? Okay, they Here, let's say they choose to measure the uh, spin down particles, the blue uh, particles. And so that's the image that they get. And then in order to talk about strings, uh, they compare it to the optimal checkerboard, right? So they're saying, uh, uh, if we had, if the system was not doped, if we had a class current from magnetic state, we would have a checkerboard. And now let us just compare like positions uh, that we saw of uh, this uh, blue fermions relative to the checkerboard, and we mark the differences, right? So like, so this marked uh, sites, right, correspond to differences, and we see that they, that, okay, here we have an object of length four, here we have two objects of length two. So let's call them string and let's uh, just sort of put them on a histogram. And let's try to collect more data of this type. So basically you do this experiment, uh, sort of like raw image difference from checkerboard, you get a histogram and you do it many times and you get a distribution uh, of the strings. So here, what is shown is actually, it, it is half filling. So even at half filling due to both quantum and thermal fluctuations, quantum fluctuation arise from the fact that it's not an Ising kinetic from magnetic, right? It's, we still have a plus as minus term. So we generate some spins even at half filling. And then because temperature, right, is still uh, kind of not zero, then we also have thermal fluctuations. So this is our background. What we are really trying to see is an increase in the number of strings uh, on top of that. And uh, this is what uh, they have measured. So you see this kind of uh, blue uh, dots on top. Uh, so these are now probabilities of strings the function of length, but notice that the probability is in the log scale. So something that may not look like a small change actually is almost a factor of 10 increase in the probability of having longer strings uh, in the system. Or, uh, but you can also ask, oh, but I mean, this, uh, like this is something that we uh, arises from doping, but we know that as we dope, we simply remove some of the uh, correct particles. So is it possible that this increase in the probability of strings is simply a result of that we extracted some of the fermions? Uh, the answer is no. So this is what's shown in this yellow line. So if we simply start with the same images that we have at half filling, then we just randomly, you know, remove fermions uh, just to get the correct doping levels, we would get a slight, very slight increase in the probability of strings. It would not be, especially the long ones, it would be insufficient to describe the actual increase uh, in uh, the probability of longer strings uh, that uh, we see in experiments. 
And okay, okay sorry, I forgot to mention, and this green line is this geometrical string model. So it sort of describes reasonably well kind of how uh, like the probability of strings increases with doping. And that's another way of characterizing the data. So it just shows the probability to find a string on a given site. So as a function of doping, you see this is half filling. So already at half filling, we have a finite probability uh, to see a string. And then uh, as we dope, the probability increases. And if we were to just randomly remove uh, the uh, fermions, it would, we would not get such a kind of large probability uh, of strings. So clearly the uh, kind of most of the increase in the number of strings has to do with the holes moving and sort of like reshuffling the spins rather than with just uh, removing fermions. Okay, uh, but I also promised to see where this uh, polaronic picture begins to break down. So for this, let me uh, uh, discuss uh, recent experiments uh, from Munich. Uh, and uh, now what they, uh, as a motivation uh, for this experiment was an idea that, okay, if we look at coup rates, we can look at different types of measurements, say RFS, you know, Nernst effect, and uh, they uh, all suggest uh, that there is some kind of a sharp crossover, which depends just on doping. That system uh, on the right, so the for larger dopings behaves as a kind of a from a liquid, whereas for the undoped regime behaves in a very unusual way. We can call it pseudo gap or uh, assign different uh, kind of explanations, but we just know that it's different. So the question is, okay, can we see something like this uh, behavior uh, in uh, the experiments with ultra cold atoms? And I'll try to show you that indeed we see a crossover from polaronic liquid uh, in the underdoped regime, and the precise dope, the doping level, which seems to come out of uh, the cold atoms experiment, is around thirty percent, and on the right it looks more like a Fermi liquid. So uh, the fact that it's a different doping level is not surprising uh, because it, it, it probably depends on details of the uh, of the model that we use, like of tight binding model. If it's just nearest neighbor, not next nearest neighbor, so in Cooper rates we know the terms beyond nearest neighbor are. Uh, hoping are important for us for uh, the kind of Hubbard mode to realize with cold fermions, it's really just nearest neighbor hoping. Okay, so to make a long story uh, short, uh, I will, so we already saw that nearest uh, sort of diagonal correlations changed sign, right? Uh, so we know that uh, like exactly uh, at half, uh, feeling uh, they uh, uh, okay so here okay so the color coding here is uh, that uh, we have uh, right so yeah so the color coding is uh, that we have anti-promagnetic uh, correlations right uh, as uh, 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 right if, if they are blue so uh, the uh, I guess no, maybe it's okay. It's this since uh, I'll just shorten. So this was uh, the uh, uh, measurements of the spin of the diagonal spin correlation function uh, as uh, a function of uh, distance uh, to uh, the uh, hole, and so we saw that they changed sign, uh, right? And so it turns out. Okay, sorry. I guess I eliminated too many slides. Uh, that if they look at all the data. Uh, meaning not just next nearest neighbor, but say longer range correlation, let's say some uh, sites which are separated by two lattice constants. So all of the correlations which used to be uh, ferromagnetic uh, close to uh, half filling, right, from the antiferromagnetic state, beyond the doping level of 30%, they become antiferromagnetic. And antiferromagnetic uh, correlations uh, is what we expect from the from a liquid picture, like at, when distances uh, Basically, we know that there is Pauli principle, so we're very unlikely to find two fermions with the same spin close to each other. So uh, if we think about just uh, from a liquid perspective, uh, then we expect uh, in a certain range correlations to be uh, anti-promagnetic, whether they're nearest neighbor or next nearest neighbor, uh, or even longer. And that indeed is what's happening. So, okay, so I actually don't have the data. This is just a summary, but you see that essentially all correlations become uh, anti-ferromagnetic uh, if the system is sufficiently doped. And this happens around, uh, uh, like this crossover happens around 30%. 
then uh, you, they can also measure uh, spin susceptibility. But in fact, they measure it uh, by using fluctuation dissipation theorem, also using images. Right? What they literally do, they take a small, uh, okay, like well, not small. It doesn't. It has to be sufficiently large so that we can talk about long wavelength, uh, like a subset of the point, and they just look at fluctuations of total magnetization. Right. So if and then you know that fluctuation of total magnetization. Uh, uh, they are determined by correlation function. We can use uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem, and uh, from using this fluctuation dissipation theorem, we can then infer the uh, uh, actual response function, which is spin susceptibility. And we see that at large enough doping, uh, this uh, uh, spin susceptibility behaves as uh, in uh, the from a liquid, just simple RPA type calculations work. But as we come close uh, to uh, half filling, we see that it's saturated. Clearly, starts to deviate uh, from this uh, kind of perturbative calculations. We don't see uh, like this full-fledged uh, uh, pseudo gap uh, because uh, uh, the system is still at high enough temperature. Uh, but we can clearly see that the behavior changes uh, at uh, like thirty percent. Uh, Okay, and then uh, there are, so the, okay, if obviously the question uh, you want to ask is, oh, do you see any signatures of pair formation? So no, it's still temperature is too high to see actual bunching of, uh, of holes, right? But what is interesting is that if you really kind of zoom in at uh, just like you say, oh, let me choose configurations which have two holes next to each other. And then let us measure spin configurations around these two holes. Then the spin configurations they are very similar to kind of spin configurations that we would get in a system where we have hole pairing. So to get a system with hole pairing, we can just take a six leg ladder, right? Which uh, with the MRG, we can solve very well. We know that holes bind. We can just look at what the spin configuration looks like around that uh, Cooper pair. And already at this temperature, actually spin uh, configurations are very similar to those uh, uh, like uh, seen from the MRG. So uh, the bottom line then is uh, that it appears uh, that uh, there is something uh, that happens at 30% uh, that the system changes uh, from the fluid, which is well described uh, by, uh, uh, by this picture of magnetic polarons to something that is much better described by a picture of uh, the empty from magnetic from a liquid. And I apologize for not taking you slowly through uh, all of uh, the data. Uh, okay, uh, but okay, maybe let me uh, 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 move to the next subject that's still related to the Fermi Hubbard model. So, uh, another question that we uh, wanted to ask is it's really like Annabelle's uh, idea. Well, okay, we know that uh, in the last few years, machine learning tools uh, have become very powerful for this uh, sort of analyzing images, distinguishing cats and dogs. Can we? Uh, ask them to do something useful and sort of analyze snapshots. And uh, in particular, what uh, she and Fabian have done was uh, to uh, take two kind of di very different theories of doped Hubbard model. Uh, so the first one is an RPB theory. It's some kind of, okay, I'll not go through uh, the details. It's some kind of mean field uh, constructed out of uh, spin liquid state. Uh, and so it it sort of assumed that the fact that holes disturb magnetic uh, correlations, uh, but it's sort of taken at the mean field level rather than this local level. Whereas uh, in the geometrical string, as we saw that all this kind of uh, reshuffling of the spin changes and spin configurations happen in the vicinity of individual holes. And then, uh, okay, so you just have, you have three ways of generating snapshots. So you have two theories and you have one, uh, uh, experiment. And you can sort of try to compare them in different ways uh, using uh, the, uh, like uh, convolutional neural networks. And the first thing uh, that they did was to take uh, sort of uh, off the shelf standard approaches. And let's say you just take have some training data, you analyze it on this uh, three ways of generating snapshots. And then you ask to identify correctly the, uh, the new ones that you bring in that were not used for training. And what you find is uh, that the, uh, this neural network say immediately sort of, or they sort of are much better at separating pi flux uh, results from this kind of RVB pi flux calculation 
from both experiments and from geometrical string. However, they have a very hard time distinguishing uh, kind of uh, snapshots generated by uh, uh, the string model from snapshots generated uh, by experiments. So this suggests uh, that actually, uh, like at least for these doping levels, uh, uh, kind of pi flux theory is a kind of less accurate representation of the doped from the Hubbard model than this geometrical string model. Uh, or you can do like things slightly differently. You can train the data just using theoretical models. Uh, like so no experimental data was used uh, at the training stage. And then you uh, introduce experimental snapshots and ask uh, neural networks to assign them either to the pi flux or to geometrical string. And it assigned them uh, sort of uh, predominantly to, uh, uh, to uh, the geometrical string model. And it may look like it's not a big change, right? There's just like a 15% preference, but I remind you, this is an assignment made just on a single snapshot, which is roughly kind of an image, maybe like eight by eight. Uh, so it's very limited amount of data, right? And so obviously accuracy is small. If we start sort of increasing this by sort of giving, like say, our just four snapshots, but then we say, oh, they all come from the same data, then immediately this 50% uh, increase translates uh, to uh, kind of 80% uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, so, but in this case, actually interestingly, so this uh, kind of distinction between pi flux RVB and uh, uh, the geometrical string seems to fail around 15%, which again suggests that kind of stronger doped regime uh, better described uh, with a different, by sort of more from a liquid type uh, approaches. Okay, but this, like this, the disadvantage of this uh, CNNs is well that they're kind of like a black box. They give you an answer, but they don't tell you why. So this is uh, where uh, actually uh, Annabelle and uh, collaborated with uh, Cole Miles and Una Kim from uh, from Cornell, and together they developed a new architecture. So it's it's kind of a special type of neural network where you cannot just uh, sort of want to find a kind of a stable way of distinguishing to uh, like different ways of generating the data, but you are able to extract what was it, like which configurations were primarily responsible. Uh, since I don't have time, I'll, uh, I'll not talk about this, but uh, just sort of show you that yes, from this we, re uh, we kind of learned that already kind of foresight correlation functions were the ones uh, that uh, actually uh, provide most of the uh, of the difference between pi flux and geometrical string, so you can see configuration, which let's say is a strong indicator of the uh, geometrical string. Is when it's, like we have a hole and we have antiferromagnetically correlated spins on the diagonal, just as we saw uh, in the experiments. Okay, maybe this is a good place to take another pause and ask any more questions. Uh do you have any questions? Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. um, this is about this uh, spin spin correlators, spin, spin, near side spin spin correlators. I remember that there was, if I remember correctly, it, it was Charles Lichter a long, long time ago, very nice work uh, when, when they showed. Uh, again, I'm not sure, but but my recollection is Charlie was there. That spin-spin um, correlator, at least near the spin correlator, is independent of doping. So, is in parent compound, it is the same as in 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 medium doped and heavily under doped. And this so, was somehow confirmed by Riggs about decade decade ago. Is there any so, connection? But... Uh, I, I, so I'm not sure what exactly you mean. Right. Are you talking about like static holes? So I know that. No, no, no. I'm some... talking real compound cuprates. You can no, no, measure. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like real compound, but you think you put like zinc impurity. No, 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 and no, then no, no, you are... no, no. It's not related to impurities. It's not related to impurities. You either do what people did a decade, a decade ago, RICS when you just go to very high momentum transfer and you directly measure spin-spin correlator or Charlie, again, it was 90% probability that it was Charlie. It was sort of NMR at high temperature. Very, very nice experiment. Claiming that correlator okay. is doping independent. 
I, okay, it, I hope you can send me this reference. It's not. I will. I don't uh, because the problem with an MR, right? I guess it's okay. Like so, it averages over all momenta, right? I don't know because, like you Maybe see, that the evolution of spin correlators think. is very different for nearest neighbor or diagonal. Like I, I can basically tell you, like how no, they, they can uh, all correlators only nearest neighbors, not diagonal. So in this case, uh, no, they do change. I think. I, uh, okay. uh, no, I think they they get smaller. Uh, but I'm not sure, like how Charlie could make it conditional on being next. To I'll a send. This is very very strange result. Very, in, but it was confirmed by Riggs. Again, Say, like even in the case of Riggs, like okay, a Riggs introduces a hole suddenly, right? Again, it's much more complicated dynamics. But uh, no, but they measure spin spin correlated. No, but okay, but if you, I mean, if you measure just spin spin correlator, th this is a two point correlation function, right? Mm -hmm. I thought you were asking about three point correlation. Function. No, 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 two point, two point. Yeah, yeah, but two point, you can say this uh, even comes out of neutron scattering. All we need to do is just do Fourier transform of neutron scattering. Neutron later. cannot go to so high energies and so, so, so small momentum, large momentum transfer. Uh, Eugene, I send the reference. Okay, uh, uh, I, we, we have the data, like, you know, it's, it's honest, you know, it's as uh, sort of as accurate as it gets. Like oh, I can show you it's evolution of compare. nearest neighbor spin correlations with doping. Okay, good. I'll send the reference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. So the polar picture assumes that they are you know, particle with the media. So they're well separated from each other. Exactly. It was so just based, based on this picture, which doping one could expect it to this condition to be well satisfied? So he so, okay. plots uh, the doping till zero point eight. So am I right that holes? So, so I think what you can uh, see here is um, okay. This is one of the plots. So what we compare is. Uh, like, okay, the string correlate, uh, like, yeah, uh, like evolution doping, uh, evolution of spin correlation. So the dots experiments and uh, the uh, kind of this gray line, right, is this geometrical string model. And you see that at small doping, it, it works reasonably well. And then when we talk RVB, it actually it fails very badly uh, at small dopings, but at larger dopings, actual experiments is much more closer to. Uh, to experiments and this kind of crossover from where geometrical string model stops working and uh, uh, where this kind of RVB or uh, you know like a, or something even which is based on free fermions works better is around like you can argue whether it's like 30 or 40 percent and if you try to estimate what this doping would be just from the condition that as you said oh we have finite size polarons when do they start touching each other that's roughly the same 30 percent because they saw because uh, their size is few sides is it? because they're small polarons so they're sufficiently small right yes oh okay thank you uh, any other questions okay let's go ahead okay so then uh, let me uh no I don't have much time, but at least gives you a flavor of quantum assisted and MR inference. So, first of all, is what is metabolomics? Well, it's more or less the study of small uh, molecules uh, that support, uh, like, kind of, uh, know, the activity of cells, or just like of living organism. And uh, it's uh, kind of a new. It's a field that's relatively new. However, it's actively developing, and it can be used. It has already been used to study a variety of. Uh, uh, diseases like I don't know uh, cardiovascular diseases like uh, there is uh, kidney problems uh, different types of cancer but even for healthy uh, people it's actually useful like if you want to understand like let's say how caffeine is absorbed how much let's say a person can exercise you can look at sort of the evolution uh, of the small molecule say how uh, because caffeine is immediately broken into uh, the three uh, metabolites and you would imagine that <clears throat> Given the importance of this, our biomedical <clears throat> friends would already know everything about 
metabolites uh, relevant for humans. Well, it turns out that this is not the case uh, and that uh, they uh, know something of the order of just like a few percent of all the metabolites. What they do not know, they call dark matter. So there are many small molecules uh, which are known, which are sort of suspected to exist, but we don't know what they are. And uh, well, to be quantitative, right? So what we extracted from the literature is out, they suspect that there is at least 200,000 metabolites, but uh, then they identified only 2,000. Uh, and if you look at how many actually used, labeled and used for, uh, you know, actual uh, biomedical uh, research, it's uh, even smaller number. So there are two standard ways of uh, studying uh, metabolites. It's mass spectroscopy and NMR. So mass spectroscopy is more common uh, because it's easier to interpret. Uh, so in NMR, the challenge of NMR is uh, that uh, you're just getting a spectrum and from the NMR spectrum, you have to tell what the chemical structure is. Uh, very challenging. But on the other hand, mass spectroscopy, uh, it also has its major limitations. Uh, so basically mass spectroscopy just tells you, more or less it gives you which atoms, uh, like from which atoms uh, your molecule consists. But of course in organic molecules, you just rearrange positions of uh, two atoms and you get a, a molecule with completely different functionalities. And also for to get mass spectroscopy, you really have to extract kind of fluids of, uh, and you know, take them to the mass, mass spec. And many of these compounds are very fragile. So by the time you take them to mass spec and do all this kind of separation, uh, you actually destroy them completely. Uh, whereas in MR, you can do in, uh, in situ. So there are many advantages of actual, of uh, if we could do NMR, but unfortunately it's just uh, technically this problem of translating spectra to compounds has been difficult. Okay, and just to remind you, uh, what, uh, how does it work? Okay, so we know that, like, uh, let's just take hydrogen and like, proton and MR, right? take hydrogen atoms, it's like spin one half, it splits in magnetic field, uh, and in vacuum, of course, splitting is always the same, but in a molecule, so because we have different environments, right, different uh, sort of, the magnet, uh, the magnetism is different for different uh, hydrogen atoms, so even effective Zeeman splitting is different. And furthermore, uh, these protons interact with each other, and uh, the kind of the model for describing uh, uh, this kind of NMR spectrum uh, is uh, to have uh, spin exchange interactions. And spin exchange is uh, SU2 symmetric because okay, you can worry or a lot of it is dipolar interaction, but because you average over all spin configurations, uh, you end up uh, with this SU2 symmetric. And uh, we have this Zeeman term, but with different G factors for different uh, spin one halves. And the, what our colleagues told us is uh, that look, okay, so at least what would be useful is to find a way of going from the spectrum to this effective Hamiltonian. So if you wish, it is a kind of uh, generalization of the old problem, whether you can hear the shape of the drum, right? If you uh, hear the sounds that a drum makes, can you reconstruct what the drum is? And we know that for the linear drums, the answer is no, but because uh, but uh, in the case of actual a spin system, the answer is yes. So, uh, and that just has to do uh, with the fact that uh, we have a, basically we do not have the simple addition, linear addition of the spectra that you have for a drum in which all the frequencies are just sums of the basic frequency, like in a interacting spin systems, of course, all the many body eigenstate, they cannot be obtained just as superposition as by adding uh, frequencies of a few uh, low line excitations. And another comment about uh, NMR is uh, that temperature is so much higher than the energy scale involved uh, that effectively uh, spin correlation function uh, is measured at infinite temperature, which means that we have to average over the entire spectrum, right? And uh, of course, what this uh, means is uh, that we have to deal with an exponentially a uh, large number of states, exponentially large in the number uh, of atoms. So, okay, so basically the kind of the protocol that we uh, advocate and we think would be useful is that, okay, the way it's done now is uh, that you take your trial Hamiltonian, you compute the spectrum, uh, you compare it to uh, what has been measured. And obviously like if your first guess is incorrect, then you try to adjust parameters of the Hamiltonian and you do the cycle over and over again. And if you want to compute the spectrum accurately, uh, then you have to diagonalize in full Hilbert space, which is exponentially hard. 
And uh, so uh, the key idea of what uh, we're suggesting is that uh, to compute the spectrum, uh, we should use another quantum system, we should do a quantum simulation, but then optimization of parameters of the Hamiltonian is done on a classical computer. So this is effectively a hybrid uh, protocol that we're discussing, which a quantum simulator is used to compute the spectrum and a classical uh, Hamiltonian is used uh, to optimize parameters. So why uh, this, uh, I think this problem uh, sort of has a hope of being useful. So, well, first of all, it's, it's kind of, these are not kind of, kind of problems, which are just matter of principle problems of demonstrating quantum supremacy. This uh, uh, is something that can address the need of real technology, which is like a billion dollar technology and rapidly growing. Uh, also, if we, it does not require these, you know, super accurate quantum computers. So when we talk about molecules that are relevant to our uh, friends doing biomedical research, they just need 20 spins. So you can implement them with current NISC technology. Also, if we look about, if we think about energy scales, so NMR has intrinsic line width uh, and uh, this intrinsic line width is, uh, is actually sort of something of the order of like one tenth of the separation between the peaks. And it doesn't make sense to, uh, simulate the spectra with an accuracy that's much better than uh, the kind of what the actual spectra are. And uh, so this again shows that NISC technology uh, can be quite useful. Okay, so let me uh, skip since I'm out of time. So you can ask, okay, well, but look, if you wanted to do this procedure uh, naively, then you would still have to, what you would have to do is, okay, start with all initial state, do time evolution, uh, and then once we get time evolution, uh, then uh, we uh, sort of do Fourier transform, but we would have to sample over all initial states and that's there's still exponential number of them. So what you can show is that no, you don't actually have to do it. It's enough to sample from states, from just sectors with a certain, uh, with total magnetization. Total magnetization can take values from basically minus n over two to plus n over two. And then you also to measure magnetization, you have to do n measurements. So fundamentally, the uh, kind of the number of uh, operations that you have to do scales, uh, if you simulate a spectrum on a quantum computer, scales uh, only as n squared. And uh, actually you can even uh, uh, kind of avoid the uh, part where you uh, sort of measure just correlation function in time and then Fourier, do Fourier transform uh, on a uh, classical computer, you can just double the number of qubits uh, and so that we uh, have like a sy system uh, and a copy, an evolved system with an actual H and a copy with sort of minus H, which is kind of like evolution of a, of a brine cat with H and minus H. And then you do an analog of a uh, Fourier transform. And so as a quantum output, as an output of this quantum circuit, you get uh, the actual spectrum already. Right, of spectrum in frequency space. So it's kind of like quantum Fourier transform more or less. And we know that this is one of the powers of quantum computers is very efficient quantum Fourier transform. So, well, the uh, life turns out to be somewhat challenging that uh, actually, if you start with a completely random Hamiltonian, uh, then you will not converge to what you want because the system has many local minima. Basically, like if you try to fit the spectrum, the system fits just one of the large peaks and it just gets stuck. Uh, so you have to actually start close enough to uh, the true Hamiltonian. Fortunately, when we look at, uh, like, so this is really work done by trees. If you look at uh, real systems, real molecules, you find that they cluster. So we analyze just the case of four molecules and you find four clusters. And actually they uh, also what stands behind these clusters is that they have very similar chemical structures. They, some of them have a methyl group. So you have three identical uh, protons. Uh, some of them have, a, have benzene green, and that means that they, it looks more like a spin chain. So it has the le least amount of symmetries. Yeah, that's what's shown here, right? If you have this more kind of benzene type ring, so you get this kind of the most complicated structure. And this is the simplest uh, uh, kind of spectral where you have uh, with a lot of degeneracies from a methyl group. Uh, and so, so what we can show is that, yeah, that there is actual clustering in the spectra. And once you start from what we showed, if you start from the average of the appropriate cluster, then you can verge uh, to uh, the correct spectrum. If you use uh, sort of like for this, he uh, came up with an efficient Bayesian approach where you sort of update your expectation value of 
what the parameters are every time you get a new spectrum and so after you know like order 50 or 60 iteration let's say in the case of like we analyze just four to five spins uh, uh, you get a good convergence uh, so what there are actually some interesting physics questions along the way uh, which is uh, that you really have to if you want to implement it at current computer say either with ions or Rydbergs then it turns out that you have to uh, make protocols which are optimized for a specific platform because you always have to like now we're talking about gate-based simulations like say ions you have to break continuous evolution into operations and that's that's what's called traterization if you make traterization uh, uh kind of step very large then your traterization error is large but if you make it very small it turns out that noise comes to haunt you because in real systems noise is non-markovian uh, and then you can actually okay so like this is specific calculations in the case of simulations with ions such as the ones that can be realized say in INQ, and you find that uh if you sort of start with just allowing like 200 gates your kind of agreement of the spectrum is not so large so good you use 500 gates okay well it gets better uh and you think if you use 700 gates oh it will get perfect no it actually starts to deteriorate so that there is actually optimal number of let's say trotter steps uh for uh the simulation therefore one really come up with platform tailored design of uh quantum simulations okay so with this let me conclude uh so i try to give you uh sort of uh, work in two directions uh, using quantum simulators uh, to analyze a long-standing problem of the Fromy Hubbard model. And then the second part, uh, uh, okay, well, actually, I didn't, uh, didn't even make it here. Uh, so to talk, uh, to talk about uh, using uh, quantum simulators to do uh, NMR uh, inference. And I apologize for being uh, over time. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, I have a question. So how large is N from the pictures of molecules you you shown? It looks like N6 or 8. Is it? So the ones that we analyzed, like we de deliberately took on the N equal to 4. Like, okay. But we took actual, you know, molecules in these NMR data sets for which Hamiltonians have already been characterized. Uh, and this is what we looked for. The ones which are actually kind of food, like if we could do this for something on the scale of 20 uh, spins, 20 protons, that is what is sort of roughly the scale that's needed technologically. Okay, so there are so, six, six, four, six spins and there are, they interact with each other with the Heisenberg interactions with some interactions constants. Is it, am I good? Like in this case, right? So you have four spins yes. and you, so they call it a K matrix, which is like interactions between all these four spins because it's not like a chain. So interactions can be somewhat non-local. Of course, there is some kind of locality, but a priori, you don't know how local these interactions are, like what exactly, which spins are close to each other. So you have to allow for general interactions between all spins. Okay, I see. Thank you. Do, do we have any other questions? Uh, hi there. I had a fairly naive question, which was um, whether it would be possible to use data from some other source um, say infrared spectroscopy to narrow down the parameter space of Hamiltonians before running this iterative algorithm? Good questions, I haven't thought about it. Uh, what we figured out, at least for this, again, I have to make a disclaimer, we only analyze molecules with just four spins, uh, that if you just do, uh, kind of, you just do clustering uh, uh, algorithm, uh, then you can sort of fairly uh, you can narrow down the uh, kind of the parameter parameters of the Hamiltonian uh, uh, sort of quite efficiently because so all of the molecules in this cluster they sort of seem to have similar chemical structure obviously they're not the same but it's sufficiently similar that you you're sort of 
that you get close enough to the uh, to the actual minimum. But if one can use, let's say, completely different spectroscopy, that I don't know. It's an interesting question. Obviously, one can try to think about other types of NMR spectroscopy. Like I was talking about just one dimensional simple NMR, but they're more sophisticated, like two dimensional NMR. And that's something that we're actually trying to think about at the moment. But yeah, other techniques would be very interesting. So the answer is I don't know. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the questions.